The Philippines is quietly becoming an economic superpower, but not many people know about it because it's not covered in the news. This doesn't make you wonder why it's being kept secret. Maybe the Philippine government is waiting for the right moment to tell everyone about it. Or there could be other reasons why it's not being talked about much. As always, skeptics might quickly point out, wait a minute, isn't the Philippines still a developing nation? How could it possibly become an economic superpower? But remember that I'm not talking about the Philippines' economic status now. I'm talking about its potential to emerge as an economic superpower in the next decade or two. It's important to remember that the Philippines in the past was one of the richest countries in Asia, next only to Japan. So it's possible that it could reclaim its status as an economic powerhouse. It's not just a fantasy, but something that's happened before. This next piece of information is important for skeptics who don't believe in the economic strength of the Philippines and are too negative. So please pay attention. And I'm not just making things up. I'm not making up stories. Everything I say is supported by historical facts. The highest GDP growth in the Philippines happened from 1965 to 1973 because Macapagal liberalized the economy by removing import controls and devaluing the peso, a policy which was continued by Marcos. This allowed money to flood in to create economic growth. Basically, the economy grew the most from 1965 to 1973. Why? Because Macapagal opened up trade and made the peso worthless. And Marcos kept doing this. It brought in a lot of money and made the economy better. During 1920 and 1924, wages in the Philippines were higher than in Japan. And they were equal during 1935 and 1939. It suggested that Filipinos may have been spending money on consumption while the Japanese focus on building battleships. Even in terms of total national income per capita, the gap in the first half of the 20th century was not large. From 1900 until World War II, Philippine income per capita remained steady at about 70% of the Japanese level. In 1950, Japan's income per capita was not vastly different from that of the Philippines. The Philippines had a higher income per capita than most East and Southeast Asian nations, except Malaysia, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Is it true that the Marcos regime was the golden era of the Philippines? The golden years of Marcos is a half-truth, because although there were really were good times from 1965 to 1976, these were easily countered by the collapse from 1983 to 1985. President Magsaysay restored law and order, caused by the chaos of World War II. This allowed investment in industry, which President Carlos Garcia promoted through his Filipino First policy. It advocated local industrialization by promoting the manufacture of Philippine-made electronics and equipment. This was in preparation for the expiration of the Laurel Langley Agreement, which would expire in 1974. That agreement gave around 17 years for the country to make its industries competitive and ready for world trade by 1974. It would allow the country to export to other countries without US approval, yet allow foreign imports to flood in. The problem with this policy is that it takes a long time to generate wealth. Japan started the same strategy after the war, and it took them a long time to establish Honda, Sony, Panasonic, etc. by the 1970s and 1980s. South Korea began theirs with Samsung and LG. Taiwan started theirs with TMC, Acer, and others. China started the same policy in the 1980s through Deng Xiaoping. It took around 30 years for China to become an industrial country, but after industry established, those industrial companies became cash cows that made their countries wealthy. This long period of industrialization requires a long period of political stability and consistent policies. Unfortunately, the Philippine elite could not wait such a long time to get wealthy. This is because they were descended from Encomenda agricultural system established by the Spanish. 
That system earned by the exports of cash crops, such as sugar. The investment for such crops can be done within a year, with revenues coming in subsequent years. This makes the elite short-sighted and not capable of serious long-term investments. This is why Spanish colonization was the worst thing that happened to the Philippines. Without the Spanish, the country would be economically in between Malaysia and Taiwan. The British, Dutch, and Germans, on the other hand, did not focus on cash crops like the Spanish did. Instead, they focused on science and technology. Instead of thinking a long-term strategy to make the country wealthy, Macapagal sabotaged Garcia's plan and reversed the policy. The riches would come in first, and the burdens would come in later. This is the opposite of the policies of Japan, Singapore, and Taiwan, and their elites also got wealthy by exporting cash crops such as soybeans, rubber, and coffee. Japan, Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea did not have much arable lands, and so they had no choice but to industrialize, and as a result, they became Asian tigers. They don't have a national crisis as often, since the demand for electronics, machines, and vehicles are predictable. Anyone can predict that air conditioners will be in demand during the summer. The devaluation policy began January 22nd, 1962, made borrowing easy. At one dollar to two pesos, a Philippine president would only get two pesos per dollar borrowed, but at 3.8 pesos in 1965, he could get nearly twice. When it was time to pay, he could simply devalue further to 6.4 and still have money for free. This was a form of devaluation which was a common tactic of ancient and medieval Europe for kings to get rich quick. In reality, the debt was paid by Filipinos through inflation which manifested as the skyrocketing poverty during the stagnation period in the late 1970s. Marcos kept on doing this until the peso fell to 14 pesos in 1983. The Philippine government during the Marcos regime tried to find new lenders, but could not find any. Without new loans, the Philippine economy collapsed, causing a capital flight, leading to a minus 7% GDP in 1984. It finally led to the coup by Ramos in 1986. The Marcos regime during the early to mid-70s focused primarily on improving the economy and the country's public image through major increases in government spending, particularly on infrastructures. Its main beneficiaries were the tourism industry, with numerous constructions, such as the Philippine International Convention Center, the hosting of international events like the Miss Universe and the IMF forums to be able to improve the international status of the country. This policy generally continued even through the 1980s, when the world was experiencing stagflation, an international debt crisis, and high increases of interest rates. The early effects of the increase in government spending were generally positive. Private businesses and firms engaged in aggressive investment and spending patterns. As a result, the GDP increased. The government in 1970s also focused on an export-led industrialization program, which focused on non-traditional manufactured exports and foreign investments. This led to an increase in foreign direct investment in the country, with this growth in the export sector. After that, the Philippines economy stagnated. During those stagnation years, Filipinos had no choice but to export themselves as overseas workers to earn the dollars needed to prop up the economy. The most absurd thing is that instead of correcting Marcos' policy, the Philippine elite who led the succeeding administrations even made overseas workers as a state policy. As I mentioned earlier, between 1910 and 1939, the Philippines had a period of being the richest country in Asia, but then slipped to second place. Despite being a US colony for 50 years and a Spanish colony for 300 years, the country made significant changes. It ranked high in Southeast Asia, Asia, and globally in terms of both economic and military power. But over time, other countries progressed faster, leaving the Philippines behind. And don't forget, the Philippines experiences 20 earthquakes every day, and not to mention typhoons and other natural disasters. Despite all of that, the Philippines economy is continuing to grow. According to the IMF, if the Philippines continues its projects, it could regain its second place position, surpassing Malaysia and Vietnam in terms of economy 
by 2030. Despite lacking strong infrastructure compared to Malaysia, the Philippines is projected to catch up. By 2030 to 2035, it could even be the second Southeast Asian country to reach a trillion dollar economy. Now let's talk about the state of the Philippine economy today and in the future. The economy of the Philippines is an emerging market and considered as a newly industrialized country in the Asia Pacific region. In 2023, the Philippine economy is estimated to be at 25 trillion pesos or 436 billion dollars making it the world's 34th largest by nominal GDP and 14th largest in Asia. The Philippine economy has been transitioning from one based on agriculture to one based more on services and manufacturing. It has experienced significant economic growth and transformation in recent years. With an average annual growth rate of 6% since 2010, the country has emerged as one of the fastest growing economies in the world. The country's primary exports include electronic products, transport equipments, garments, chemical products, copper, nickel, and many more. Its major trading partners include Japan, China, America, Singapore, South Korea, the Netherlands, Hong Kong, Germany, Taiwan, and Thailand. In 2017, the Philippine economy was projected to become the third largest in Asia and 15th largest in the world by 2050. By 2035, the Philippine economy is predicted to be the 19th largest in the world. The Philippines has been named as one of the Tiger Cub economies alongside Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Thailand. By the year 2055, the Philippines is expected to surpass most Asian countries. Can the Philippines become an economic superpower?